Hello, and welcome back to Under the Orange Lights, a live webcast that connects the Orange Theory Fitness community with industry experts. I'm your host, Dr. Rachel Reed, the Senior Director of Health Science and Research at OTF, and we have one of my very favorite guests joining us today, Jacqueline London. She's a registered dietitian and WW's Head of Nutrition and Wellness. And on our episode today, we have so much great content to cover. We'll be recapping key takeaways from our eight-week educational series that we worked on together, answering tons of your questions, and even busting some nutrition myths. So Jackie, welcome. Can't wait to get rolling. Yay! I'm so excited to be here. This is so exciting, and I can't believe how much we've covered. I mean, I can't believe, I also can't believe that we're here in April of 2021. That really flew by. I know, and April is already like halfway over. So right. I know we already have people tuning in. If you are tuning in, don't forget that you can ask us questions live today. We would love to hear from you in the chat. So tell us where you're tuning in from. And if you have any questions at all for Jackie, now's your time to ask them so that we can handle them throughout our conversation today. So, oh my gosh, where should we start? Should we start with SMART goals, Jackie? Let's just, I mean, who doesn't love a SMART goal? Let's start with SMART goals. So okay. Let's just start there. So we kicked off the eight-week educational series talking about goal setting and how important goal setting is because if you can set these smaller goals and then actually meet them, it sort of helps propel you forward accomplishing a bigger, more long-term goal, right? 100%. I think, you know, I think this is the moment to think about whenever you're starting any type of new goal, whether it is a fitness or nutrition or any type of wellness goal. I, I have often found myself in both in practice and even in my life right now, just thinking about where I can scale it back. Mm -hmm. Starting small, keeping it simple. These are the ways that we can optimize ourselves for something that we can consistently repeat over time. And, you know, I know we, we both feel so close to this so often, but it's always worth that reminder of, you know, if you have that kind of goal, and I think about this a lot with my own personal day to day is where can I just scale it back or simplify and make it that much easier to stick with. Um, that is always the most efficient, but also the most enjoyable way to, to get to any kind of end goal. Um, and that kind of leads me to the next sort of point, which is that consistency and enjoyment are really critical. I mean, I, that's another thing I think we've really learned over the last year or so is that doing things that feel like they are truly purposeful and enjoyable to us um, can take lots of different forms and they can often be the things that are the most surprising but as long as we're doing we're taking steps that really feel like they're meaningful to us like they're nourishing to us um, and like they're repeatable that's the that is ultimately the most efficient path to getting anywhere on any goal and then of course staying connected you know we both come from places that really feel so strongly and believe in the absolute power of community. And I think staying connected also takes different forms all the time. But I think that connection to either what we're doing or who we're doing it with or both is really where the magic happens. Anytime you have a community involved um, in any way, shape or form, the more likely you are to, um, to have a goal that you can truly stick with because you enjoy it that much more. And there's that kind of built in accountability factor that makes everything um, really feel like it's in sync. Absolutely. And speaking of community, as I heard you say that word, I'm seeing people who are tuning in from Colorado Springs, from Denver, from Oregon, California. I mean, all over the country and all over the world. So cool that we've created this community even digitally. So don't forget everybody that, you know, even if you're not back to the point where you are seeing you know your workout buddies in person or seeing friends and family in person you can still connect with them and create that sense of community in other ways totally i love that i love a good virtual challenge i feel like you guys do such an incredible job with that um and creating that community in digital platforms is, is just amazing um and and really inspiring well, thank you. And same to you guys. Okay. So I've also heard you talk, Jackie, about creating solutions that fit with your real life. And I think this is 
linked exactly to what you were just talking about, but can you expand on that a little bit? So in practice for me, I've seen so many people who will often come in um, saying something like, oh, I just wish I could cut out sugar, but you know, I, I have no willpower or I just want to, you know, I want to lose weight, but I have no time or energy to do that. Or I want to eat healthier, but I can't afford it. There's lots of different ways that these kind of self-imposed barriers pop up. Um, I, I have often referred to them as sort of like our boundary bullies, right? Like they're the things that, that, that come up that seem to stop you from, you know, staying on your own path or staying within the, the framework of your own lifestyle. And I think that's what we really mean when we're talking about creating solutions for your real life is what are you, what are you currently doing in your day to day? Your food and your physical activity choices have everything to do with where we spend most of our time, right? So if we're most of the time at home or most of the time at the office or most of the time running around and taking care of other people, then we're going to have to find ways to, to find, you know, better for you solutions within that framework. So working to, to create that kind of personalized framework, that's something that WW has really worked super hard on in terms of our digital experience, as well as our um, virtual and in-person communities. But it really is something that any one of us can start right away right now. Like we can all find a different way to, let's say, you know, you're used to grabbing your breakfast at the office, but now you're working remotely. How do you shift that kind of behavior to think a little bit more in terms of what's available to me right here? What do I like to eat? And how can I make choices that are going to fuel me for the next couple hours of back to back meetings so that then I feel satisfied and energized until I get to lunch? That's the kind of um, shifting of, of mindset that, that really creates that powerful and more lasting behavior change rather than thinking, oh, I've got to restrict, I've got to cut out, I've got to eliminate. Um, I often think about, um, about how much we say things like that. And I, I think so many of us get caught up in those traps of shoulds and can'ts rather than thinking about the things that we can do more of. And, and when I say we, I mean, really, you personally can do more of in your everyday. Absolutely. And actually, last time we talked, Jackie, you were talking about water and how so many of us are not getting enough hydration throughout the day because we're on Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting and you feel rude, like grabbing your cup and like with your straw and like slurping in a sip here and there. Right. And so for me, I that really helped me. Our conversation and the pointers you gave about just like figuring out, do you have a cup that you like? Like, can you take a sip between every single meeting? So just little things to make you know, make it work for me and where I am right now. So I love that message. And I think it's super helpful. Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's really, and I, I think, I think in a lot of ways, depending on how we have shifted our current workspace or shifted our current lifestyle in whatever way that, that, um, that this past year and a half has kind of done that for us, um, many of us have found that there are new solutions that might be working really well. There might, you know, there's always this sort of moment in time where it's kind of time to take stock and think about what else or what next or where are you. And there's lots of different ways that we can feel stuck and we can feel stuck, um, you know, no matter where we are at any given moment. And I think just having that kind of framework of what can I do more of or, or what do I want to do or what would I like to do right now that's really within my reach? Like, can I get outside for a walk um, at this moment or can I schedule a walk in later today? Those are the ways that um, that I think always bring up new opportunity. And, and really, that's the way to kind of keep it fresh, even when things feel a little bit more stale or rigid, depending on where you are, or what's going on for you personally. There's always is that kind of okay but now what um and thinking about it from that more expansive perspective really really helps to to just stay generally more positive i completely agree okay so we have a question from holly and i think since i mentioned hydration we're getting some questions about hydration and she wants to know does coffee count Yes, coffee counts. Coffee counts toward your daily hydration goals. So coffee is mostly water. It often gets a bad rap, and that is only because it can have a slightly diuretic effect, but that doesn't make it a dehydrating effect. So just because it'll make you pee doesn't mean that it means that you're actually dehydrated. So that's really important because so many of us will um, either avoid it or not. But actually, caffeine is is what you would call an ergogenic aid. That's like a really fancy uh, term for um, 
sports nutrition aid. So, and it's, it's pretty safe for the majority of us. I, and I would caveat that with the statement that of course it's always up to personal tolerance, but that kind of 300 to 400 milligrams per day of caffeine, which is about three to four cups a day of coffee, um, really works for so many of us. And especially in that, you know, having a cup in that kind of half hour window before you are going to an orange theory class or you are, you know, getting an outdoor run, those are, those are definitely smart choices that both will help you hydrate and that will um, counter your daily hydration goals, but that will, that may also help you feel like your endurance um, is up a little bit more. So I would, I definitely say power to coffee. So we're seeing some really funny comments coming in. Tim says, yes, coffee counts. Um, and Beth says, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I can count coffee for water. So I think you just made a lot of people's days, Jackie. So thank you very much for telling us all the secrets. I'm so happy about that. Oh, and tea. I should mention tea also. And I should also mention my one other tip, which is to keep it unsweetened when you can. I mean, there's lots of different ways you can add different types of sweeteners, but the only kind of caveat to that um, would be that sometimes when we get lots of sugary beverages, we can also feel that crash that comes with yeah. uh, this sort of blood sugar fluctuation within your normal. So I would say keep it pretty basic. Keep those coffee, keep, keep that coffee pretty basic and you can count it as well. Water. I should make that statement too. <laughs> I love that. So we're seeing also a lot of messages. Um, well, yeah, Brian says <laughs> that was enlightening. And Kevin actually is pointing towards our next topic. He's saying this community and this community is awesome. And we were talking a lot about community, but I want to expand on social support a little bit because I know this is something that WW definitely is built around and so is OTF. And so I think it's something that a lot of our audience tuning in is familiar with and is craving right now, right? We've all been sort of like isolated over the past year in one way or another. And so that social support is really important. Can you expand on that? Yeah, you know, I mean, we've learned so much more than I think we've always been. Um, we've always been built around community. And um, and what's really fascinating over the last year and a half is that I feel like we've all learned so much about how community can mean lots of different things and one thing at the same time. It can mean, you know, how we are supporting one another within our um, within our app. We have our we have a, um, a social media platform that is for members only called Connect. And it really is, is such an inspiring place um, that's really just so amazing. But we also, in the middle of all of this, just launched D360, which is our latest membership platform, um, membership tier, which really is a new community that is built on coaches um, that you can, uh, that, that, really provide that support, but also provide that inspiration that I think so many of us are craving right now, right? Like that, what can I do with this ingredient? Or, okay, this person is doing this 10 minutes of meditation once a week, I can get on board for that. You know, there's some of these ideas that maybe we didn't think of ourselves as a meditator or a chef or any of these kind of other philosophies that really are core to WW scientific background, which is food, activity, mindset, sleep. Um, but finding the ways to do that within one's own framework, sometimes we just need an example and we need people that can be with us um, on that journey that really help us to, to stay accountable and to stay in support of one another another, which actually get us to supporting ourselves or staying on our own side. I think that's been really one of the greatest challenges, um, really, <laughs> really of time, but also just, you know, of, of our current circumstances is feeling like we're staying on our own side. You know, it can be really easy to get caught up in what's happening outside um, or what's happening within our own within our own communities, but having communities that help us feel a little bit lighter or a little bit more like ourselves by doing these practices, having routines that, that really help us hone in on what healthier habits mean for us personally. I think that's really invaluable right now. I could not agree more. And it looks like the chat is feeling the same way. So Marty says, Orange Theory and WW together saved her life. So Marty, amazing. We love hearing love this. Marty, you are a rock star. And we love that. And the community is holding you up. So I love, I love this so much. Yeah. Kevin also is sharing a story with us. So Kevin says he's lost people through his OTF journey. And there have been days where it'll just break down when people leave the class after a hard workout. And the coaches and essays are just so great at comfort and everything. And so 
We love that. We love our coaches and essays. And I know WW, you guys have amazing coaches as well who really are the glue that, you know, holds so many people together and provide that inspiration that so many of us need. So I love that. I love uh, that. And Marty is saying he's a he. So thank you for correcting me, Marty. Um, I love that. So Marty, yay. Um, yeah, I just saw that A1C also. That's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, so much good news here. So I want to kind of switch gears and talk about, which I think the chat does too, talk about how training can really impact your nutrition needs. So we actually had a really good question from Tammy. Let me see if I can pop back up and find this question from Tammy. So she says, question, um, advice for someone who is successfully losing weight, but is looking for help with fat loss in targeted areas. Ooh, this is a good question. Good question. That's such a good question. And also such a tricky question from a nutrition standpoint. I feel like I'm going to, I'm going to start with the bad news and then get to the good news. So from a nutritional standpoint, it's really tough to spot train with diet. It, in fact, it's pretty much impossible. However, on the journey to losing weight, to starting to make choices that include more nutritious, more nutrient dense foods um, while training, that there is only one direction that, that can go in and that is the positive direction, right? Because you're always, if you're starting to, um, to build muscle and starting to feel like you have a routine that's really working for you or foods that are really working for you pre and post training, um, those are ultimately gonna be the back um, the foundation of healthier eating habits overall and really what are going to provide you with the structure and the framework to make um, everyday decisions that much easier because having that kind of structure in place makes it that much simpler to then allow for those moments where you're like, okay, now we're going out for ice cream and I just want to have this Rocky Road ice cream cone, whatever it is. Um, so I would say that, you know, while we can't spot train, we do know that overall a more Medi Mediterranean dietary pattern, um, a Mediterranean lifestyle of only we could be in Greece right now having this conversation. <laughs> but, um, but more seafood, more whole grains, more nuts, seeds, plant-based oils, um, low fat, non-fat dairy products. Um, and of course, hydration is critical but making sure that you're having any source of protein, whether that's um, animal-based or plant-based, totally up to you. But having that lean protein included with meals and snacks and, and including protein and fiber as parts of your meals and snacks can help to keep both that energy up, but also help you stay satisfied between meals. I was also going to add from the exercise perspective that resistance training is also really important for helping to shift your body composition, yeah. right? And we know you know, especially if you're eating in a caloric deficit, if you are exercising too, resistance training can help you at least maintain your lean mass while fat mass is changing. So I think that it all works together, right? Which is exactly what we oh, want yeah. to talk about here. So that was a good answer. And oh. Tammy, really good question. <laughs> I love that question, Tammy. Yeah. Okay. So um, tell us about how exercise impacts your appetite, right? Because we're seeing a lot of chatter in the chat here about, you know, I get super hungry after I'm working out or I'm feeling like I need to fuel before a workout. So talk to us about this topic. Okay, so this is um, this is a tricky one because there are a number of different gut hormones that are working sort of synergistically, but also can be working at different points in time, depending on the type of training that you're doing, or they might they might have different effects from uh, from myself to Rachel. So like we can both do the exact same workout and still feel like one of us is ravenous and one of us just cannot possibly eat right now. And that is totally normal. So while it is, to it's completely likely that you could feel really ravenous after you work out, no matter what you had before. And it's really likely that you could also feel like you don't feel like eating and that you don't want to eat until a couple of hours later. What I've often found a there, there are, a couple of things that really play a role in that that we can actually control one of which is hydration of course because hydration mm -hmm. can 
often, so often I see this, which is that people confuse thirst and hunger. And sometimes, um, and if we let it go too long, right? Like if we're in our back-to-back -back meetings where we haven't had enough to drink and then we go for a run later and all of a sudden we're feeling super hungry and we don't really know why we're feeling kind of bottomless. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say more often than not, it has to do with how hydrated you physically are. So I would say step one would be to make sure you're staying hydrated about eight to 12 cups, although there is a massive range in there depending on where you live, how humid it is where you live, how strenuous your workout was, but that's always a good place to start is in that eight to cup eight to 12 cups a day range okay. um, and then kind of go up from there or down from there depending on what you personally feel like you need um and then i would say that that the consistency factor is what's key so having tools around and i must say that ww is really amazing for this but having tools around that help you track so how did you feel before during after how hungry were you did you have the same pre-training meal before you um before you started your activity uh that's really important because that will help you gauge exactly how you want to make changes or what maybe you would want to do differently for next time i often give the recommendation that eating within um an hour to up to about a half an hour is usually okay for most people but some people feel like that can really mess with their stomach or make them feel like really exhausted so it, it's really about the combination that works the best for you and if you find one thing that just so happens to work for you great then that's also great and it really you know there's not really that many hard and fast rules we often give in sports nutrition we'd often give the the recommendation of you know about two to one um carbs to protein ratio so that looks like okay. you know, a big apple with a piece of cheese or you know um let's say it's a piece of toast with nut butter something that combines protein and fiber together is usually your best kind of pre and interestingly your best post recovery um snack of choice is is always great but I would say that it really all goes out the window if personal tolerance isn't at, at front and center of what all of that means is that it's only as good as your ability to apply it to your real life. And by ability to apply it, I mean, how do you feel? Do you feel really energized by it? Do you feel like that makes you really hungry? Do you feel like you have food sloshing around in your belly while you're trying to run? And that's kind of annoying. So there's yeah. lots of different ways um, that this can come up. And, and I would say that as long as you're trying things um, and, and thinking about the timing, the type of meal that you're having and the tools that you can use to make sure that you're staying consistent so that you have a framework of what's working for you versus not, you're in great shape. Well, that was so much helpful information. Like, I feel like I need to take notes. Okay, so a related question that's popped up a couple of times, Jessica in the chat says, is it okay to do an OTF workout while fasting? like considering it fasting cardio. And I know this is one that is such a hot topic right now, right? Do you work out fasted? What are the like supposed benefits of that? Tell us from the nutrition point of view. So there's not that much by way of research to support, you know, consistent fasting and fasted cardio versus having a meal or snack before doing um, any type of cardio workout. There's really mixed research, actually. Um, you'll get some studies that will have found this to be potentially beneficial. You'll see others that say it doesn't matter. And then you'll say some that say don't do it. So it, that's where it really comes in um, the personal tolerance. Yeah it really comes back in is that if you feel like that's working for you jessica then i'm super supportive of it but as long as you are staying hydrated and and making sure that you're not um skipping out on that water that's pretty important and then just making sure that you're checking in like are you feeling a little bit lightheaded during that time period if you are then of course that's when to, to kind of think about how you might do it differently next time. But um, but there's not, you know, it's really mixed in terms of what the literature actually says. So okay. that's where it really comes back to what works best for you. I love that. Yeah. So what works best for you? How can you fit it into your life? Going back to what we talked about earlier, just kind of like linking all the pieces together. Okay. Full circle. So one more comment here. Um, Marty says that he usually eats two hours to an hour and a half before OTF and make sure that he's staying hydrated and that tends to work Love really that. for him. Love that. Love that. I think that's great. Yeah. So it seems like, you know, as long as you can find something that works well for you, that's fueling you for your workouts, you're going to be in pretty good shape. Okay. 100%. I love that. So what about post-workout fuel? Yeah. So 
you've had a tough workout, you know, at Orange Theory, we're doing higher intensity, higher work rate workouts, right? You're leaving with your splat points. You might need to refuel afterwards. Recommendations for that. So I would start with your, um, with making sure that you are up to date. I like to say up to date. It kind of makes it feel like it's like a browser update up to date on your hydration. So, so I would say first and foremost, an eight ounce cup of water at the very least, and, and definitely more like a 16 ounce to 24 ounce kind of bite bottle of, um, of water is the best place to start. But I, you know, I get this question a lot because this will change a little bit depending on the duration and the intensity of the workout that you're doing. And at, at OTF, that's where, you know, if you're coming back and you're repeating the activity of being in um, being in an Orange Theory class, then you're going to start to notice your own personal patterns and the things that are working best for you. I often make the recommendation that if you're training for an event, so let's say you're training for a marathon or a triathlon. That's when you really want to make sure that you're eating something within this kind of 30 minute window of when you really, your muscles are totally depleted. You're, you know, you've been going for a couple hours at that point and you really, you really want to make sure that you're getting back um, a little bit of that, of those carbs to help you recover faster. That's when that's really critical. But for, for someone who's regularly going to Orange Theory, you have a bit more of, of a window to, let's say, do um, 30 minutes to about an hour. Hour, maybe it's two hours for some. So it's really dependent on personal tolerance here also. But I would say that finding that that balance between what feels like um, like what you need and what feels like you're setting yourself up to, to make better choices for yourself later on, that's what's the most critical, right? Because so often we'll find ourselves kind of confused, especially for people who are just starting out with any new exercise routine. Yeah. You're kind of like your, your body's confused or your brain and your body are confused together, which is in that space of, I feel like I should eat, but maybe I'm not hungry, but should I eat? Or am I, did I drink enough water? Right? Like you're, you're kind of playing that game with yourself at first. So I would say start out by making sure you're hydrated. Then I always recommend, you know, having that combo of protein with your source of carbs, your fiber. Um, when in doubt, I always give the advice to add more produce because, you know, more produce more often might as well be my, my little tagline. <laughs> I had a personal tagline. It would be that. Um, but it. there's no, there's no way to go wrong with that for many, many different reasons. But one reason that I love so much that is kind of a sneaky one is that you'll get some of the, um, some of the minerals that you might lose in sweat back into yourself pretty quickly by having some piece of produce. Let's say it's a banana or an apple or an orange. Um, but you're also going to get some of that fiber and you're getting water with that snack. So as long as you're getting produce plus is kind of like how I like to think about it is produce plus as a nice little post workout snack that's a simple way to make sure that you're getting all of the nutrients you need but also catching up on your hydration goals um, and staying satisfied for longer and then you can continue with the rest of your day as you normally might but i would do that within or aim for um uh starting around an hour after your workout at the very latest um because that'll help you kind of figure out what you want to do for the rest of the day I love that. And actually, Megan has a question that's related to this topic. And I think it's hinted around the idea of like, do you need this like big bolus of protein right after your workout? Or is it better to spread out the protein throughout the day, sort of get protein with every meal? Oh, I, you know, this is, this is another one that's really all over the map in terms of where the research stands on this, because you're definitely, you know, there's definitely going to find these really small studies that will say like, have something with protein right after, but really protein is the, to get to make the most out of the protein that we eat, we really need a source of carbs with that. So when I hear things like about like people drinking some kind of protein water or something like that, I think, oh, like, I hope that's tasty. Because otherwise, I don't know if you're really <laughs> getting what you wanted from yeah. it. Um, but it is, yeah. I think it's it's really about that consistent protein intake. Because what you're not what you're not able to use is going to go into this kind of free amino acid pool in your body, and then you're just going to kind of get rid of it through um, through your body's own metabolic processes. So I would say don't worry too much about protein. Most of us are really getting enough protein, but having that consistent source, making sure you're having a having a source of protein. Um, 
in your post-workout snack is always the most efficient, but having that protein with the source of carbs, it's only going to be as efficient as your source of carb that's in there. So you want to make sure you get that in also post-workout. I do feel like that's one I get a lot. It's a great question. Yeah, that was a really good question, Megan. And Jackie, amazing answer. Okay, so (laughs) we have some myth busting as we sort of like wrap in the last 10 minutes here. First one, um, apple cider vinegar. When I'm scrolling on social media, I'm seeing this trend everywhere. It's all over my explore page on Instagram. What does the nutrition science actually say? So I, I'm so sorry. I feel bad. I feel sad about this because I do feel like it's all over. And I wish it were true that it was like some sort of magic elixir. But there's like really like little to nothing is what's out there in terms of research on this. I mean, it's it's really kind of incredible. The only, the, the thing that I think is great about apple cider vinegar is that it's, it's a fruitier flavored salad dressing, right? So we're lots of us putting balsamic and olive oil on our salad. And I feel like that's amazing. But sometimes you kind of want to switch it up and maybe you want to have some apple cider vinegar to make a marinade or make a different type of salad dressing or have as part of a soup or a smoothie or a, I don't know, because I don't, there aren't that many uses for it. It's really just about that dressing, I think. (laughs) But really the research, there's just not much. You know, there's all this kind of hype online about it being um, antibacterial or uh, it's somehow um, helps people with weight loss for some mysterious reason that also doesn't really exist in research. Although there is this very, very, very tiny sliver of research that suggests that it may help to delay gastric emptying, which is kind of like part of your digestive process where you slow down the rate of absorption between your stomach and your small intestine. That really doesn't affect that many of us. And there's not much by way of the research to support doing it for this perceived, you know, sense of fullness, which we're not going to get. I always say that if you're feeling full because you just had some apple cider vinegar, it's likely because you're, you know, you just set your internal uh, organs on fire by swilling vinegar <laughs> from the bottle. You know what I mean, right? Like, it's yeah. kind of like, but maybe that's just acid reflux. Like, so that's I would say better, your better bet is to use it as a condiment and not a cure-all. Okay. Well, you heard it here, everybody. Okay. So our second myth, um, what about bullet, bulletproof coffee? Ooh. I have never tried this, but this is something that I think has been around for a couple of years. First of all, what is it? It kind of grosses me out, but from the science perspective, what's the deal? Okay, so there's a couple different ways. My understanding is that there's a couple of different ways to make it. Some people would say that you would have um, coffee plus grass-fed butter only, um, and that you can add some spices in there if you like, or you can add some zero sugar creamer. Then others would say that you have to use MCT oil or coconut oil um, and have that as part of your coffee beverage. There again, this is one that is that really gained a lot of momentum when um, when this kind of fasting trend started. I think it's there's a lot of, of the low carb diet enthusiasts that really feel like bulletproof coffee is an amazing way to start the day. It's sort of like the you know if fra- if a frappuccino is your higher sugar version of a coffee drink, then bulletproof coffee would be your higher fat version of a coffee drink. And in both cases, it really all depends on what your personal taste preference is, what your goals are, and what your lifestyle is. Ultimately, if you're going above what you personally need in a day, that can can have the effect of weight gain in the long term when you're repeating that choice over time. Um, and, And similarly, if you're creating a deficit at the end of the day, that can also lead to weight loss over time. I feel like um, it's really more about the flavor in this, in both of these instances. It's that it's really about what you like. So if you prefer that butter in your coffee to half and half or to milk, then you know power to you as long as that's helping you on whatever your wellness journey is. Then then power to you. But if you feel like you're drinking it for a perceived health benefit, I can't say that there's much um, to that. It's all about you know how it fits into your everyday meals and snacks. I like that perspective, how it fits into what you need throughout the day. Okay, and last myth here is oxygenated water. Um, What is going on with this trend? Yeah, this trend really, I feel like this kind of blew up sometime around 2019. I feel like I started seeing this everywhere. Yeah, there's not much here. There's not that much here either. 
unfortunately. I I would say that um, that I have not seen that much by way of um, by way of products that aren't sweetened that have this oxygenation. So it is definitely just like coconut water, just like uh, cactus water. I've seen um, there's other aloe water. There's different types of these kind of trendier waters that always kind of make their their little appearance in our lives um, at, at some point, you know, throughout throughout our days. But uh, but I would say that as long as you are staying hydrated from um, from the water that you're drinking, and as long as you are making choices that are as low and added sugar as possible. That's the simplest way to hydrate and to do so efficiently. Um, and you'll get those minerals that you need that also help with hydration from produce, from um, from legumes, from nuts, seeds, from dairy products, uh, from protein sources. So you really don't need those in excess of, of what you're getting from food. Um, the only thing that I would that I would say as far as the hydration question goes is that I, I didn't even get to mention this earlier. It's always my favorite little pro tip about about making sure that your pee is like a, a kind of straw color um, because that's really the most efficient way to actually tell if you're staying hydrated. A lot of times people will be like, how do I know if I'm actually hydrated or how do I know that that was enough water for me today? So look for your straw color pee and then you don't need expensive water. You can just have regular water. Well, I think that's something that we'll all remember. I, I love that tip. I feel like I'll be checking for sure. Okay, so one more myth um, that came up through the chat. Dahlia is asking, what about eating before bed? Like, is it good? Is it bad? Does it depend? What do you think? You know, that's another, this is another, I, I feel like I, I hate to answer every question with personal tolerance, but it really is personal tolerance because the thing that, um, that plays the biggest role in how, in what you need before bedtime is really going to be, okay, how long before bed? Because if it's more than a half an hour, um, then you should be, you should be pretty good, but it really depends on how, um, and how you digest and absorb food. I would say limit things that are highly acidic or really high in dietary fat. And that's because those are the things that can cause reflux the fastest and that's important okay. because if you're gonna lie down then um then I would say you don't want to stay awake at night because you had a snack that caused some reflux that made that kept you up all night that made you feel kind of weird and disrupted your sleep so most important would be how it fits into your pattern overall is eating before bed going to cause or you know or or start weight gain or loss no that's all dependent on what else you're doing in a day and what you're doing tomorrow and how it fits into how much energy you burn versus consume during the course of the day so i would say don't worry about that it's really all about the pattern that you set up by doing so by eating closer to bedtime if it's helping you get to sleep because a lot of times we will stay awake because actually our stomach is growling and that can mm -hmm. also cause sleep disruption so it really depends on what works for you but that half hour window i would give um no matter matter what, just because you don't want to eat something and then go lie down. I love that. Very good practical advice. And I'm loving seeing all the chats about the straw colored pee trick. Ashley says that she's a nurse and she always asks her patients about the color of their. I love that. I love that. So there we go. Across disciplines. This is a good trick to know. Okay. So we have covered so many topics. And I think to wrap up, what I would love to do, Jackie, is to hear a little bit about how we can sort of anticipate some of the roadblocks that come up that can limit our success when we're thinking about how to fuel properly and how to make things fit into our lives. So I know one that you talk about is like lack of sleep. Can you address that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, lack of sleep can can be a real disruptor for multiple reasons, one of which is, you know, if we're tired, it can be that much more challenging on all of us when we're starting something new to to draw on our own personal reserves to kind of get up and get out the door to go either, you know, to go get something done to go to get some some activity in for the day, or to, to make healthier food choices that can often feel like a major hindrance. That mm -hmm. being said, I think, you know, I think really, it's important for all of us to consider what rest or what, um, what true purposefulness 
feels like for us because sometimes that's more important than actually getting to sleep. And I say that purely anecdotally and not uh, based in any research because research will tell you to sleep, but so many of us can't sleep right now, right? I mean, we've got other things going on in our lives and it feels like, can sometimes feel like that's just another thing on the to-do list that like you have to get home is to get to sleep, right? So I would think about like, where can you take these breaks that actually just help you shut it all off and feel a little bit more like yourself throughout the day? Or can you take one break throughout the day that helps you feel a little bit more like yourself? Um, Whether that's getting outside to take a walk, whether that's listening to a podcast with Rachel and I, or (laughs) that is um, maybe going and watching something, an episode or something that you love. Sometimes that can feel a little bit more energizing than just the sleep alone. So thinking about reframing it from that standpoint really has helped me personally and and, um, in my work working with other people. Um, And then I would say that to be wary of misinformation, you know, there's so much out there when it comes to food and physical activity and and healthier habits overall, I would say it's ultimately always comes back to what works best for your lifestyle. So if there is anything that makes you feel like it's, you know, the extreme Olympics of, of eating or whether you're doing something that feels way far out of your comfort zone when it comes to staying physically active, like so far out of your comfort zone that you could hurt yourself, that's when you really want to make sure that you're scaling back, keeping it simple and thinking about what's important to you, which is ultimately how how to reach any goal, no matter what you're doing um, over time. So, so be wary of that misinformation and, um, and think about what works for your personal lifestyle and what personal habits that you know you'd like to change and where you can do more. Well, wow. We have covered so much. Um, audience, you have had the best questions ever. So thank you so much for all of your participation. Jackie, thank you for being here. You guys have been tuning into Under the Orange Lights. We've been talking with Jackie at London from WW. Make sure you like and share the show. And if you love our episodes of Under the Orange Lights, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, like our Facebook page. That way you never miss an episode. Thank you all so much. And until next time, stay healthy. <laughs>